Welcome to this tutorial on sub-D modeling in Rhino. I'm going to show you the essential tools you need to get started, show you how sub-D modeling works, and also teach you, or begin to teach you, the principles of good topology and what that means. So I've just got the Rhino file open from the last tutorial, and we're going to um, model an organic shape. This is what you'd use sub-D modeling for versus traditional NURBS modeling. It's when you need to model something organic, something with double curvature. And um, what we're going to model is, I'm just going to open up that folder. In this folder from the last tutorials, I had created a couple renders. And actually, I think I have it in this folder here. I, I, I put that through some AI tools like Midjourney to just come up with some ideas. So for instance, based on some of those renders and some additional prompts and blending, I created this image uh, based on what we started to model in Rhino last time. During the animation tutorial, for instance, I had this one. And I really like these organic shapes. And I'm thinking, why not teach sub-D modeling through the process of creating these shapes in Rhino? and then eventually try to build out these drawings in um, an Unreal Engine or something like that. Actually walk through the process of doing a full world build. I would disclose that sub-D modeling is great, especially when you're coming up with surfaces like this that are going to be engineered. But typically, programs like Maya, Blender, ZBrush, these are mesh modeling programs. They're They've been. This is what those programs have been built for for ages. So it is a good idea to learn mesh modeling in one of these programs, and I'll go into that in the future. And I think that if you're going to do sub-D modeling in Rhino, it's probably going to help you if you've done some basics in uh, mesh modeling programs before. But nonetheless, I'm going to show you how it works, and I'll also do a quick demo in Maya on how it's similar to mesh modeling. What's nice in Rhino is you can take the sub-D model and convert it to a NURBS model very easily. And that's why it's great for engineering purposes. Whereas if you have a mesh model, you know how difficult it is to turn into a NURB surface because essentially a mesh is composed with uh, a ton of different spaces. Well, they're polygons, basically. When you convert a mesh to NURBS, you're basically just creating a bunch of individual polygons, surfaces. And that's not nice at all. Especially, they're not going to be smooth. There's going to be a problem with resolution always. Let's use like this shape as a reference here. In your Rhino viewport, I've created a new layer here. I've gone up to Sub-D Tools. And it's a good idea, uh, in my opinion, to start with a, for learning purposes, to start with a primitive of some kind. These are all of your primitives. A cone, a truncated cone, a cylinder, a sphere, etc. Ideally, you start with a shape that, if you were like modeling something in a clay, you want to find like the primitive or the block that's going to get you to your result as fast as possible. So if, if we're modeling like this shape here, you wouldn't start with like the torus because it has a hole in it already and you'd have to fix that to get to this. Um, maybe you could start with a cylinder, but ideally you'd start with probably a sub box. So we're going to click that, start at the origin. I'm going to go three point and I'm going to turn on projection for a moment. 1.5 meters, 1.5 meters by probably 1.9 meters or something. And I'm just going to go in and click save. So we've created our box here. And I've done it to real world scale or what I think is real world scale for this object here. And it's honestly getting very close to that, <laughs> just as it is right now. It's quite an abstract shape. If we click it and we hit tab on our keyboard, we can see a more, um, what I would call like a polygon representation or a flat representation of the shape. And when we hit tab again, we see the smooth version or the subdivided version. Okay, so you're you're going to be constantly switching between this version and this version. Tab, tab. And we can show what's going on in Photoshop. We have a shape like this. And we have a line here and a line here. Okay? 
these are where these curves meet up are vertices. When we do a subdivision, what's happening is this, these edges are being collapsed. So this is becoming like that. This is becoming like this. And I can do it in another color here. This is becoming like this, this is becoming like this, and this is becoming like this. We move that out of the way. And we're looking at it from the same perspective. We hit tab. That's basically what's happening here. Okay? It's just being subdivided. So we can infer that if we draw a box again, and there's no curve here, and there's no curve here, or what's called an edge loop. And when these are our only vertices, then when we subdivide, what's going to happen is this. <laughs> We're going to have an even smoother, almost spherical representation because the edges are now collapsing even further. There's no vertice. The, the closest vertice, which was here, and this one create that curve. But now we have nothing. We just have these vertices. And so that's being collapsed. And these are being collapsed. And these are being collapsed all at the same time, creating a sphere. In Rhino, we can hold Control and Shift and double click on these edge loops and then hit the Delete key to get rid of them. So if we delete that one, delete this edge loop, and delete this edge loop, we're left with our Photoshop representation. And if we hit tab, you can see that we get this, or something close to it. It's not exactly precise. right? If I scale this in the Z direction, we can get closer to perfect sphere right because this is not a completely perfect square right it was 1.9 and our sides were 1.5 so if we go down 0.4 meters then we have a perfect cube and if we hit tab now we have our sphere all right or more closely to what we originally drew there that's all you, you really need to understand it's this relationship between vertices edges and faces they give us the shape that we want. So let's let's model this guy here. So let's go back up to let's go back up 0.4. All right. So now it's collapsing too much. We need to add resolution. If we go to our sub D tools, one of the first essential tools to use is this one here called Insert Edge Loop. We can click it, and it wants us to select an edge uh, to use as um, it, basically, it's going to use this as a template to add our edge. So if we select all of these, the full edge loop at the top, and hit enter, then it's going to give us a new edge that we can add. And I'm going to add this one back in the middle. So I'm going to turn off my projection and just try to find the middle here. So maybe turn on vertex for snapping. So we go vertex there, vertex there, middle. All right, so now it's a little bit more, not a sphere, but a bit more of a rectangular prism. We can select this edge loop and move it up and down. And if we hit tab and do that, you can see how we can shape this even better. So I'm gonna, look at my reference here and go, okay, we probably need to go a little bit more at the top here, like this. And it sort of breaks up at the bottom a little, and it's a little irregular. So we're going to need to do what's called an adding more resolution. So you can add, select these edge loops here. Go 
insert and now we'll add some more resolution in this direction. Basically back where we started. But I'm going to look at this and we've got a slightly um, lower end here and a higher end there. So we can select just that edge and just move it up. Just so, ever so slightly like this. And we could even select this edge and move it down. Okay, maybe a little bit more up. So this is our shape here. Now if we want these to be more perfect, we could select both of these faces. So control shift to select. Then I'm going to change my gizmo to object. And then I'm going to select the Z axis of the objects and hit zero. That's going to flatten these faces so that they're both have the same normal. I'll switch this back to C plane. Okay. So now it's um, a bit too rounded this way. Now we could add an edge loop in the center here. Or we could probably just do a scale. This is another way we could do it, is we could scale this in one direction, make it half its size. And we could select these faces and extrude them. All right, and we might want them to be equal to this dimension here. So we could do a distance from there to there, 750. Maybe we want these edges to be a bit softer. So what we could do is start to scale or move these edges downwards on both sides. Just a tightly so a little softer. And maybe we move this edge at the top up a little like that. If you look at our reference, we have these two sort of bulges on opposite ends. To create those, we could actually just select one of these faces and extrude it down by hitting the little circle button there. And we could select this one and extrude it down. And we can adjust these later. This guy here, I would just move it down slightly more. This one here, slightly less, or maybe half the height. So we can actually do some precision here. We can hit tab on our keyboard and just move it half that distance simply by doing a scale with it selected. Scale from here to here to there. Hit tab, and we have what we are looking for. I like adding precision. And we also have got in our reference, it sort of goes in and then up. So we got to tighten up this, its center. And that's happening right about midway through. So we could select this entire edge loop here, go into front view. Let's move it halfway down. Um, so halfway between here and here. So we could just click and move it from between that point and that point we want to hit the middle there we go and if we zoom in we can see oh this side's not completely flat or straight so maybe we want to fix that we can select vertices by hitting control and shift and selecting just the vertices on this side and if we click this button here or the little scale tool and just zero it that'll straighten out that edge it's a good good idea to do that every now and then just to keep things straight. So if we take this edge loop here and we use the shift and scale, we can shift, we can just bring it inward slightly. Okay, if we look at our reference, 
I can tell our object's just slightly too tall. You can almost want to shrink it in the Z direction. Let's exaggerate this a little bit more. Holding shift, bring it in. Select the entire object, and let's just scale the Z until it's a little bit more squished. Let's say like this. Now, I think we need to select this face here and bring it down. And this one a little bit too. If we look at that, basically got these faces even. We want one to be bigger than the other or twice as big. What I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna move that face to this one so it's equal. And then I'm gonna move it again from this distance to this different distance. I'll make sure I have project selected and to do that. Okay. Ah, so that first time I moved, I didn't have project selected. So I'll select it or select this one. Move it so it's equal. Oops, move it so it's equal and then move it again from there to there so it's twice. So here's our shape, hit tab. Okay, it's a bit too long, but I, I sort of like that. Um, we could even move it so it's three quarters by selecting face here, S scale 1D, and we could scale from here to the midpoint between those two. There you go. I like that. It feels like we could potentially, if I look at my reference, move this loop down just a little bit. And maybe scale out a little bit more. Like that. Now we might want to adjust individual vertices to help shape this out. We haven't really done that yet. For instance, we could adjust this vertice. Control shift and select it. And let's just move it up. something like that and what other ones I'm just looking here there's a sort of little bump off of the edge like there so we could take that vertice and move it out this way which is kind of hard to do exactly we could try selecting select object and that'll give us then the normal to work with and so we can then move out that vertice this way Ah, but now what's happening is it's pulling that whole edge and we want that edge to come back in. So we're going to need some more resolution. We can select this edge loop, click insert edge loop. Uh, not both sides, just above. I'm going to hit tab so I can get a better view of this. I'm just going to bring it here. Hit tab, select that vertice there. And I can just bring it in and bring this one out. Just do some basic sculpting like that. It's a little bit softer than what we're got going on, so I'm gonna select this and select C plane, move it up. Okay, that's not bad. We can go into our tab mode, and maybe we want to take this edge here and make it all equal. So we could do that by hitting the Z scale zero and go like that. There we go. This is getting there. And we could apply a material that's similar to this color and look at it in ray trace mode. Okay, I'm just gonna fast forward through this part because it's not really relevant to this tutorial. Essentially what I'm doing here is I'm just creating a custom material in Rhino and I'm applying that to our model. I'm using um, a reference as an example of this material. And I also create a ground plane and apply a simple material to that. I'm checking out the render view mode and the ray tracing view mode, and I'm just trying to find something similar to the aesthetic of the reference. Other than that, there's really not much to this whole section, and that's why I'm fast forwarding through it. So let's move on. All right, cool. So there's our shape. It's very similar to this shape here. And that is the basics of sub D modeling. 
of course you're gonna probably model something more accurate than this. What I suggest you have fun while you're learning, just playing with abstract shapes and creating what's called good topology. Inherently, I know what good topology is and so I made sure that I was doing that. Um, you wouldn't want this situation actually happening all that often. So what I might do is where you have edges, two edges aligning with each other. So I might just scale these by 80%. Uh, not, ju not just in one direction, sorry. I'm gonna hold shift when I do that. And there we go, that's a bit better. So I've included these links to show you some examples of good topology, or what's called hard surface topology. This is what professionals in mesh modeling do for making characters that are animatable or hard surface models refer to things like, a lot of people make guns or furniture for video games. They use mesh modeling tools to do that because it's so lightweight. And it is, in my opinion, the best way to do it still. But sub-D modeling is great. Um, and I think you need to learn both. But I've included these links because it kind of can show you the way that the polygons look, where they put edge loops, situations like corners like this, how it should. If you're trying to create a hard edge like that, and without it collapsing on itself, you have to add more resolution around the edges in this. This is how you do that um, in a clean way. The other one I s put there is this archive of images. Okay, this is all. Be these are all examples from 3ds Max or Maya or Blender. But essentially, sub-D modeling is the same thing. All right, I'm just going to fast forward through this part too. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm showing how in Maya through the same process that we went through sub-D modeling in Rhino, I can create the exact same shape with the edge loops and the vertices and the faces all in the same place. And then I can subdivide it in Rhino and we're gonna have more or less the exact same result. And I'm just trying to show that the process in a mesh modeling tool is identical to what sub-D modeling is. So understanding how to do it in a mesh modeling tool is very helpful. In Maya, if I hit three on my keyboard, I can subdivide it and we're gonna get this, basically, which is the same as hitting tab and getting this. Same topology, same result. The problem is when I subdivide this, smooth it. So I'm just gonna go back to th this version, right? So that's called subdividing and I can bake those subdivisions in by deleting its history. If I tried to engineer this surface, like if I wanted to CNC it or something and break this into NURBS, all of these individual faces are gonna become surfaces. It's not ideal at all. It's fine if we're doing this for Unreal Engine or world building and what have you. But what's cool in Rhino is we can take that and we can type in um, NURBS or two NURBS. If we click this, and don't delete the input options. And I'm just gonna move one of these out of the way. This sub D object that we can organically model is getting now turned into, if we explode our object here, and nerve surface here, 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 here. The algorithm decides where those surfaces are created. And I mean, we can, do NURBS operations now on these. We can do a NURBS extrusion, a NURBS scale, right? And that's really important for architectural modeling. So this is the main reason uh, that you wanna learn sub-D modeling, but also I, I hope that you understand why learning mesh modeling is also important. In future videos, I'll go into more detail on mesh modeling because for world building, it's a lot more efficient. There's a lot of tools here and the main one we used was this one. Additional tools that are important are slide is here. We can select an edge and say we wanna move that edge up, but we wanna keep it on this. We don't wanna move it up and then create like, see if we move this up, it's gonna create this hard thing here which is going to make a soft like you say we want to move it up but like can keep this ring keep this 
the flow of this going. Um, if we select that edge and we and we use the slide, that will allow us to do that. Okay, if we hit tab and look at this, that's what's going on here. Okay, so that's a very important tool to use. So I, I tend to use moving up like this, and I tend to use the slide in certain situations. The other ones that might be important, but I think I'll go into in future videos, are beveling, as well as this one called expand edges. Like say we immediately wanted to create a hard edge at the top. We wanted this to almost be sharp at the top, but continue to be a sub D model. We're gonna select these edges. And we can do two things. One is we can bevel here. All right, and if we hit tab, you can see, okay, if we come really close to the edge, see how we're making it more sharp at the top. We're, we're basically adding an edge loop on either side and we can add more segments and less segments. Like if I had 10 segments here, you can see what's happening. I don't find this a very useful tool because in mesh modeling, when you use bevels, it's because you're not actually using a subdivision workflow. So technically when you're doing a subdivision workflow, the only thing that's really useful is a bevel with two segments. And you don't even want this hard edge to collapse. Like it's weird in Rhino that if we change this to two, and I've tried all the different modes here, it's always gonna collapse this edge. We, you want, a lot of the times when you're doing a sub-D work, workflow, you don't want that edge to collapse. So I think the solution is this little weird tool that they made. I'll show you it in Maya to what, what's supposed to happen. But there's this little tool here called um, expand edges. And if you click it, it gives you like options here like offset medium small style is like double means like on both sides so that's the one you want to do probably most of the time i would do small or custom and now if we hit tab and look at this that's creating a clean edge that's good topology right there so use this more than a bevel in my opinion um like if we choose offset custom and do like 0.1 Okay, I see how it's getting like really small now. That's gonna give us a nice sharp edge. So I would probably do offset custom 0.15. No, 0.125. Ah, 0.1. Yeah, whatever, 0.1, hit enter. Created a nice clean edge around where we want it to be. If we hit tab, we have a nice sharp edge there. If you go to rendered, you can see what that sharp edge looks like. Okay, say we want to do that at one of these bottom pieces. It's the same principle. We could take this, go to our sub D tools, expand, and then does it memorize? Yes, so we hit enter, All right? And it's gonna create a nice hard surface there. Um, yeah, you wanna definitely get in the habit of using that. This is the, the way that if you're doing good topology, this is how you create a hard edge. You add resolution on, other, on either side of the, the thing that you're trying to create a hard edge on. Now there's another way of doing it, which is you select the edge, and I don't recommend this method at all. It's kind of bad practice, but it exists. Obviously it exists in Rhino because it's not a tool made that, it's not designed for people that are coming from a background in mesh modeling. Mesh modeling tools, some like, I know Blender has this feature. You can add what's called a crease It'll make that edge darker, and now when you subdivide, it'll keep that edge hard. Okay, so here's the difference though. And this is why you don't see it in meshes, in, in mesh rendering, pro mesh modeling programs. Is, okay, which of these, this side or this side, looks more realistic if you were to render it? There's never a hard edge in the real world that's this sharp, maybe like diamonds or something, but even that. So that's why you, you just, you, you move these closer and closer together until you get your hard edge. Like, um, so you don't want to use that crease in my opinion, not a good idea. I think we could just go back. Okay. We could select these and do our expand edge and just custom and just go the smallest possible, which is 0.05, hit enter. 
and we'll do the crease on this side just to compare. Yeah, there's a remove crease tool as well. All right, this is hard, this is hard, but this still has a slight bevel to it. It's very hard to tell if you're gonna do a render. This is not proper. <laughs> it doesn't look right at all. So that's just a good thing to get in the habit of doing. If we look go to our ray trace mode, it's very subtle, but this looks like a more realistic ray render than this. Okay. Maybe if you're doing an engineered surface, you might use this method um, because you'll like go afterwards with sandpaper if you're cutting something out of wood and do the bevel yourself. But if you're planning on using these for renders, do it this way. And what's, what's happened when we go to NURBS? So it creates this. Okay, so this is maybe better for engineered surfaces because now we have surface, 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 and one surface down here. Whereas here, our surfaces wrap. So I guess it depends what you're going for. So a tool like Maya, uh, again, what I was talking about is you would s select an edge here and I would do a bevel. This is what's going on in Rhino. It's kind of doing that kind of bevel, right? And that's not what we want. So you do, it's not, we don't want the chamfer and then we bring the fraction into 0.1. And then we have our hard edge. So very simple. All right, I hope that helps. And until next time, thank you.